welcome to another One History Help revision video with me, Mrs O'Neill. As you can see, today we're going to be looking at individuals from the medicine course. Now, I've left it kind of generic calling it medicine because all sorts of different exam boards call it something different. AQA call it Britain, the health and the people. Uh, I believe EDUCAS call it uh, medicine and health. So hopefully you understand that it can be used for any of these different topics. So in this video, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through all the heavy hitters from the medicine course. It may well be that I left out some that you have learnt about in your lessons, especially when we get maybe towards the end of the modern era. Uh, but nonetheless, that's not to say that the ones you've been taught are wrong or I've forgotten them or anything like that. It's just about focusing, like I said, on those heavy hitters. Um, I'm going to divide it down into the different time periods and go through people with that in mind. There'll be a few points about them on the screen itself, but mainly I'll be talking it through from there. So I hope you find this useful and we're going to be kicking things off very shortly with the ancient period. Then we'll go into the medieval times, the Renaissance, industrial, and finishing up with the modern. Now, as always, have whatever you need to in front of you. You can just watch, you can just listen. You might want to have something to write with possibly and something to write on to make any notes that you might find to be useful. Uh, whatever works best for you. OK, so let's get started. Let's kick things off then with the ancient period. Now, once upon a time in the old GCSE with the medicine through time course, that course extended from the prehistoric era right the way through to the modern day. Whereas in the new GCSE, the medicine courses that are out there generally start during the medieval period. But the reason why I'm going back to the ancient Greek and the ancient Roman times is because we need to be aware of two key individuals that are going to have a lasting impact on medicine and health during our study. So let's start with the main man himself, the father of medicine, Hippocrates. And as you can see in the right there, if you ever need to remember how to spell Hippocrates, it's Hippocrates, as in a hippo in a crate, as you can kind of see from that picture. I didn't draw that. But anyway, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, the father of modern medicine, some of you might well have heard him referred to as well. Now, the reason why we're going way back to ancient Greece here with Hippocrates is because of the idea he came up with which is the theory of the four humours. And this is going to be the basics for medical treatment and diagnosis for centuries. Okay? Uh, it is exactly what all doctors will be taught in their training right up until pretty much the early industrial era. Really, really influential. And the ancient Greeks were big thinkers. They were the ones who were sitting on rocks, musing up at the stars, stroking beards and things like that. And they noticed that people tended to be ill when something was coming out of their body. Great observers, the Greeks. So what Hippocrates surmised was that there were four main liquids, four humours inside your body. And as you can see from the diagram down there, those four were blood, yellow bile, black bile and phlegm. And the idea was that if one of these was coming out of your body in some way, be it through a nosebleed or a runny nose or you were vomiting or you had diarrhea or something like that, it meant that you had too much of that humour in your body. And the way your body was trying to deal with that was by trying to get it out. You might well have referred to it as an imbalance of the humours. So as we can see, they are also, from the diagram, excuse me, also associated with certain elements being hot and dry, wet and cold. And that is because you are more likely to have one of these four humours at particular times of year. So the Greeks tied in Hippocrates' theory of the four humours to things like the four seasons and the four elements and so on and so forth. So, for instance, Phlegm is a lovely example we can talk about uh, between wet and cold. That's the kind of thing you would get during winter time. And yeah, we know that because we know that colds are really, really common during that time. So Hippocrates comes up with a theory of the four humours and it will be the basis for medical treatment and diagnosis for quite some time. 
Now, the main treatment associated with the four humours based on Hippocrates' ideas was bloodletting. Now, I'm sure you already know from your study that this is going to be a huge, huge treatment for quite some time, right up until we get to William Harvey during the Renaissance, who was able to prove why bloodletting is a really bad idea, but more on him a little bit later on. So bloodletting, the idea of uh, essentially making an incision in the body over a vein and draining blood from there. And the worse you were, the more blood that was coming out of you anyway, the more they were drained from you. Well, that was one of the main treatments that you would get, according to the theory of the four humours. You may also have, for instance, things that would make you purge, make you sick, or um, like a laxative effect as well. But the main one was all about blood, uh, bloodletting. So Hippocrates through the four humours, blood uh, bloodletting and bleeding. Um, also, Hippocrates was a big fan of herbal remedies, natural remedies as well. And he was also really in favour of doctors observing their patients, getting to know their patients' symptoms, recording those symptoms, rather than just jumping straight in with a treatment of sorts, actually looking to see how certain illnesses progressed. Obviously, they wouldn't just watch and let them die or anything like that. But Hippocrates was all about the method, was all about doctors really thinking. And that is still a practice that is carried on today, much like the final point there, the Hippocratic Oath, which is uh, what doctors would swear to ensure that all the work they did was ethical. This idea, for instance, of doctor-patient confidentiality, that you would essentially always help somebody when they are in medical need. And that Hippocratic Oath is still taken by doctors today. So lots of long-term significance uh, for Hippocrates. But he is not the only person from the ancient times who is going to have significant throughout, significance excuse me, throughout our course. And that person is this guy here, Claudius Galen. So Galen essentially extends on the work of Hippocrates. Now, before I get into exactly what he, he does, I just wanted to take a second to reflect on a kind of key difference between the Greeks and the Romans. The Greeks were thinkers. They wanted to understand why things happened. The Romans, on the other hand, were doers. They were like, I don't care why this is happening. I just want to fix it. Although, ironically, they would need to understand why it's happening to fix it. But that's by the by. Key difference. Greeks were thinkers. Romans were doers. So what Galen does is rather than thinking about why illness is happening, he is more so interested on how we treat illness and how we make things better. And it sounds odd to say this, but there is a certain logic to Galen's theory of opposites. And it goes back to this idea that the four humours were associated with hot and cold elements and so forth. And the theory of opposites essentially meant that if you were suffering from uh, some kind of illness which was to do with a hot based uh, um, humour, so for instance blood was a hot based humour, then you would be treated with something cold, something cool, uh, especially food wise. So for instance there would be uh, lots of things to do with mint, there would be cucumbers for instance as well. And likewise for vice versa, for instance if you were suffering from a cold, there was lots of phlegm, then you would be treated with things hot so spicy foods and so on and so forth. So that's where Galen is extending on Hippocrates' ideas. And again, that is a treatment that is used for quite some time alongside with bloodletting as well. And to an extent, we still kind of fall back onto that uh, today as well. Another thing that Galen was kind of musing on during his time was this idea of the human body. Now, as we're going to talk about in a second, Galen was big into dissection. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit more about that shortly. And he never actually dissected a human body. And that's generally down to religious beliefs during this time that extended way, way back. The ancient Greeks had similar religious beliefs as well. But Galen is around at a time in the Roman Empire when Christianity is starting to become more and more popular. So Galen's idea is, is that the body is so well put together and so well designed almost 
that it couldn't have just happened by accident. There must be some kind of divine creator. Now, the Catholic Church, the Christian Church, pick up on this and they're like, hey, we're like this guy's thinking. Yeah, he's, he's kind of singing from the same hymn sheet as us. No pun intended. I'm joking, that was a total pun intended. His beliefs totally matched up with that of the creator of God. So with that in mind, Claudius Galen gets the big stamp of approval from the Christian church for quite some time, to the extent that during the medieval times, when the church is so incredibly influential and the church is the group of people who trains all medical professionals, they say that Galen's word is gospel. Not only must you trust it completely, you are forbidden from challenging his ideas on punishment of imprisonment and possibly also death. Some of you might have uh, learnt about uh, Roger Bacon, for instance, was an individual from the medieval times who uh, was imprisoned because he tried to challenge uh, Galen's ideas. What is interesting, though, if we go back to what Galen was thinking originally, is that he never actually said that he thought the divine creator was the Christian God. He said there must be a creator, but he never made the leap to thinking it was the Christian God. The Christian church kind of made that connection for him. So this is one of the reasons why we're going to see Galen hanging around for quite some time. And we're going to come back to this idea in a second when we're going to talk about animal dissection here, about why not being able to challenge Galen is going to massively hold back medical progress. So Galen was a big showman. He loved to put on public dissections of animals to prove his theories. Uh, the one that you can see in the picture, no doubt you looked at it in your lessons, I'm sure, is of him dissecting uh, the vocal cords of a pig to demonstrate that it was the brain that controlled speech and not well, something else. Not, not, like, not like it was a kind of law unto itself as such. Um, I won't go through the whole uh, process or anything like that because I'm sure you learned about it. Uh, as well as pigs, he was a big fan of dissecting apes as well. And of course, this is all well and good, but Galen is assuming that the anatomy of animals is the same as the anatomy of a human being. So he dissected a pig and assumed that humans were the same. He dissected an ape and assumed that humans were the same. Now, when I teach this, what I often say is, well, what if Galen had dissected a cow? Some of you might be aware of this. A cow has four stomachs. OK, now, as much as we all wish we had more than one stomach sometime, um, Galen would have got that completely wrong. And remember, Galen is going to be the main source of medical information for centuries. And remember, the church said, you can't go against what Galen taught. So this is a huge deal because Galen got lots of things wrong and nobody was allowed to correct him for a long, long time. So Hippocrates, Galen, two people from the ancient times that are going to be really influential during our study. Right, let's move into the medieval period. Not too many actual named individuals for the medieval period that we're going to notice there. That's going to intensify when we move into the Renaissance, the industrial, into the modern era as well. So, um, yeah, we're going to get started with a couple of those. Uh, take a second, though, if you can, to pause this video and just take in all the amazingness that is in this picture. I adore this picture. I use it lots in my teaching for medieval uh, England. And one of the things that I ask students to do is to see, first of all, how many features of medieval life can you see and that you recognise? And then more so to do with medicine, I ask how many health hazards can you notice within this picture? Uh, I love this picture because it's one of those pictures that the more you look at it, the more you see. And every time I look at it, I see something new. So maybe take a second to pause and have a look at it if you want to. Otherwise, let's crack on with some individuals. So a group of people here, as opposed to an actual named individual, we've got barber surgeons. 
Barber surgeons were incredibly common during the medieval times and would be the person you would go to if you wanted bloodletting performed rather than seeing a doctor, uh, especially if you were poor. Uh, barber surgeons were incredibly common uh, throughout um, Britain at this time. The picture that you can see on the left hand side there is an authentic medieval barber's pole advertising what they were doing. And it's actually from a shop in Winchester. Now, the red and white stripe that you can see on there was symbolic. The red to represent bleeding and blood and the white to represent bandages. Nowadays, you sometimes see barber poles with a blue stripe on them as well. And I'm not too sure what that bit represents. But like I said, this one here is an authentic one in Winchester that goes back to the medieval times. So you go to your barber surgeon for bloodletting and possibly very, very simple surgeries, like maybe if you needed a finger amputated or a toe amputated or something like that. Very, very basic. And the reason is because there was no university training for surgeons at this time. To become a surgeon, you would become an apprentice to a surgeon who had already gone through their training and you'd study under them and kind of copy them, much like you would really if you were training to be a blacksmith or a carpenter or something like that. Surgeons were classified under the same kind of category. And eventually, after all your years of training, you'd be allowed to break out on your own and perform your own bloodletting and set up your own barber shop as such. So barber surgeons, not qualified, but a group of people who were trained as apprentices. On the whole, medieval surgery was incredibly basic. Because religious beliefs dictated, you couldn't open up a body, you couldn't dissect a body. So it meant that any surgery that was performed was very superficial, very on the surface. Um, at the same time, however, the medieval period was one that was full of war and conflict. So a lot of surgeons were able to learn their trade and learn their craft on the battlefields. And uh, I'm going a lot now into actual medieval surgery rather than talking about individuals. So I'm going to kind of pull back a little bit. Don't be concerned. There will be other um, videos uploaded that will go through things like medieval surgery, for instance. But sticking with some named individuals. Now, there is probably about six or seven uh, named individuals you may well have come across. But I just kind of picked out some of the, the main players, if you will. So first of all, we have um, Abel Cassis who was around during the 10 hundreds and you mainly would have learnt about him about how he did a lot of work developing new medical and surgical instruments i believe the number is i think he came up with 26 new medical instruments to use during surgery so he's one example of a surgeon from the medieval times uh two they come as a pair here now hugh and theodoric of luca in italy uh, around the 1200s they were challenging the common belief that pus was needed for a wound to heal because that's what people used to believe believe it or not guys that pus yes pus that yellow greeny yucky stuff that was needed to heal wounds but Hugh and Theodoric and Luca wanted to challenge that idea and instead they tried to use wine on wounds as an antiseptic now antiseptic isn't a term they would have used back then it's one that I'm using retrospectively because we know the term antiseptic today now, this wine would have been partially successful because there are antiseptic properties within alcohol. But obviously, they wouldn't have had the scientific know-how to be able to explain that. But nonetheless, good example of challenging previous ideas. And then finally, because obviously we need to be able to give British examples, especially those of you who are studying under AQA doing health and the people, because it is a British medicine study. Uh, we have John of Ardern who was around during the 1300s. Uh, this is a time of a significant conflict between France and Britain, known as the Hundred Years War, uh, which ironically went on for longer than 100 years. But he was uh, a lot of the, sorry, a lot of what he discovered was through battlefield surgery. And he was somebody who, after a while, wanted to be able to kind of set up an elite group of surgeons. There was a lot of snobbery surrounding barber surgeons. As we mentioned beforehand, barber surgeons were who the poor would go to. And John of Arden wanted to distinguish a real surgeon from a barber surgeon. So a real surgeon possibly uh, would be, for instance, somebody who trained uh, in a university as a doctor and then chose to go into the discipline of surgery as opposed to a barber surgeon that just wanted to be an apprentice and learn their trade that way. Not really an idea that took off necessarily, but it is something we are going to see a little bit later on when we get to the later medieval, not sorry, the later Renaissance era, my apologies, Renaissance era, 
when we have the establishment of the Royal College of Surgeons. But more on that a little bit later on. I mentioned previously about how there weren't too many named individuals in the medieval medicine study. One example, however, of someone who is somebody you would have learned by name is an Arabic Islamic doctor uh, known as Al Razi or Razis, he would have been known as in Europe. Now, all Islamic doctors received university style training and much like in Europe were taught uh, about Hippocrates and about Galen as well. With this in mind, Razis was a big fan of the idea of clinical observation that Hippocrates pushed. However, one of the differences between Islamic medicine and European medicine was that unlike in Europe, Islamic doctors were allowed to and also encouraged to challenge previous teachings and to find out new ideas. So Razi's wrote several books, but one of them he wrote was Doubts About Galen, where he wrote down about ideas that he wasn't too sure about and the ideas he was able to develop on with that in mind. Razi's book would never have been published in Europe because, as we've mentioned previously, going against Galen's teachings, thanks to the power of the Christian church in Europe, was a crime punishable by imprisonment at least. So Razi's good example of somebody who represents the distinguishing features between Islamic medicine and Christian medicine during the medieval times. Another Arabic Islamic doctor that you will have learned about is Ibn Sina or Avicenna as he would have been known in Western Europe. He is a really good example of the factor of communication in medicine because one of the main contributions Avicenna made to medicine was that he wrote several books, again much like Razi's as well, but the main one was this encyclopedia that he created called the Canon of Medicine. Now that's not talking about a canon like one of those things you would have used during a battle for instance, uh, a canon also refers to a collection of works and inside the canon of medicine Avicenna basically pulled together all of the teachings of the likes of Hippocrates and Galen but he also looked towards the east as well to bring in some ideas about Chinese medicine uh, and other areas for instance like specific things to do with Islamic medicine too. So he was able to bring all of those together in his canon of medicine and that would actually had a bit of influence going into Europe as well. One of the great things about the Islamic Empire is that everybody in the Islamic Empire spoke Arabic. So the spreading of knowledge, like for instance Avicenna's Canon of Medicine, was very, very easy. And during some points in the medieval period, mainland Spain, areas of mainland Spain, excuse me, were under the big umbrella of the Islamic Empire. So we have this way of this knowledge spreading into mainland Europe. And of course, we have the Crusades as well, which are going to help that. But again, not going to go into too much detail on that. There will be another video all about medieval medicine where we can go into that in more detail at another time. Now we move in to the Renaissance, the time of the rebirth of old classical ideas. Lots and lots of rapid scientific development during the Renaissance, thanks to the releasing control, but not disappearing control, the releasing control of the Christian church in mainland Europe. Our first Renaissance individual is Andreas Vesalius. Vesalius specialised in the anatomy, which is to do with what the human body looks like. Now, as mentioned, the church was releasing its control during the Renaissance. And one of the key differences that Vesalius was able to take advantage of, one of the big changes, was that human dissection was now allowed. And Vesalius used this in his studies of the anatomy. And he spent a lot of time dissecting bodies, layer upon layer, and really got into a lot of detail. 
Vesalius both studied and lectured in Padua in Italy. Now, Italy is the seen as the cradle of the Renaissance. It is where the Renaissance developed. And so uh, Vesalius would have had lots and lots of opportunities to access lots of really high level thinking and also high level artistry as well. So, for instance, Vesalius was around at the same time as Leonardo da Vinci. And there are lots of similarities in the drawings in Vesalius's book, which I'm going to mention in a second, and those of the illustrations of of um, Leonardo da Vinci as well. So like I said, Vesalius does lots of human dissection and he collates his work in his book, The Fabric of the Human Body, uh, known as also the Fabrica. And this is uh, used widespread throughout Europe as a, like an encyclopedia of what the body looks like. Because although obviously people's attitudes towards human dissection were changing, uh, human bodies weren't necessarily readily available to be able to dissect. Now, this is all good for understanding what the body looks like, not so great for understanding how the body works. But what Vesalius was able to do as part of his dissections was he was able to disprove some of Galen's theories and he was able to do that safely in the Renaissance because again with that release of power from the church it was now a safe place to be able to challenge Galen and come up with new ideas. So for instance um, Vesalius was able to prove that uh, the human jawbone was made of one bone and not two. Okay. So that's something that uh, Galen had previously believed. Vesalius was able to prove that this was wrong. He also proved that the sternum, the breastbone, had three parts to it, not seven, as Galen had previously believed. And he also discovered that the human heart did not have these invisible holes that blood would flow through. Okay. Again, a theory that Galen had that he was able to disprove and put that into his book, The Fabrica. Uh, incidentally, uh, if you have ever been to or ever go to the Science Museum in London, on the very top floor, uh, the um, exhibition is dedicated to um, developments in medicine, science and medicine. And there is actually an original copy of the uh, Fabrica there that you can actually have a look at. So that's a little top tip for you from me if you're ever out and about in London and looking for something to do. Next, we're going to have a look at Amboise Paré. Amboise Paré. Amboise Paré was a French battlefield surgeon. So his specialist area was surgery. Now, there's a couple of things that we can attribute to Paré's developments. For example, we have the use of ligatures, these silk threads that were used to stop bleeding. Now, previous to the use of ligatures uh, on the battlefield, if someone was bleeding, then there would be the process of cauterization where a hot iron would be placed against the open wound to seal the veins and the arteries and everything shut to stop the bleeding that way. Now, that would have been successful, but it also would have been incredibly painful. So, so ligatures, these silk threads, almost imagine like a stitch, would be used to tie the vessels up to stem the bleeding and stop that from happening. Fantastic. Much less painful. However, bit of a drawback, those silk threads would not have been uh, hygienically cleansed and so therefore would have carried a lot of infection. So not always a successful thing, but they were unaware of this idea of infection during the Renaissance because we haven't had germ theory yet. So they were, there was no idea. All they knew was that Paré's ligatures was a lot less painful in stopping bleeding than using a cautery iron. Something else that he developed as well were false limbs. Amputations were incredibly common amongst battlefield surgery and had been pretty much since the dawn of time. And one of the things that Paré was able to do was, for instance, develop a false hand, okay, a false limbed hand that would, uh, if you've ever seen pictures of it, is very, very mechanical uh, in the way it works. Now, I want to do a nice little link between individuals here because Paré would not have been able to really think about this idea of producing false limbs if he didn't have a developed knowledge of the anatomy. So we can have a nice little link back to Vesalius with his work there as well, because obviously Vesalius' fabric of the human body would have helped Paré understand the way muscles and everything like that were linked together.
Now, another one that we can talk about as well, which is a great example of the factor of chance, is Paré coming up with a herbal gunshot wound remedy when he runs out of oil to cauterize wounds with. Now, he doesn't come up with this in uh, this recipe um, using rose and turpentine and everything like that off the top of his head. It was actually an old Roman recipe that he was able to bring back to mind and use. And it was so much more hygienic. And within the herbal ingredients that were used, there were lots of antiseptic properties within that as well. And it was much, much, much more hygienic than using that oil and cauterizing, which, as we mentioned, was incredibly painful. But it's something that he came across completely by chance. Had that oil not run out, he wouldn't have had to go back through his memory to coming up with some of the older recipes that could have been used. So a great example of chance as a factor in the role of medicine. Uh, in addition to that, um, Paré wrote over 10 books on his work in surgery as well. Going to see that as a bit of a common factor amongst our individuals. Pretty much most of them wrote books at some time or another. We have the first of our two British examples now of individuals from Renaissance medicine. We have William Harvey, and he specialised in the physiology of the human body. Now, physiology is to do with how the body works. Anatomy, what the body looks like. Physiology, how it actually works. And physiology was kind of coming into its own at this time because of the allowing of dissection. Now, he was a very famous and very successful doctor, William Harvey. In fact, he was so good at his job that he was actually the uh, doctor of King Charles I. Uh, he's the one who gets beheaded after the English Civil War. But Harvey, very good at his job, very prestigious in his field. The main discovery that he makes, and for me, I personally think this is probably one of the most significant discoveries in medicine, and I'll explain why that is in just a second, is that he discovers that the heart pumps blood around the body in a one way system. Let's unpick this a little bit further. Previously, Galen had taught that your body recreates blood all the time. It gets burnt up in your liver and it gets recreated all the time by your body. Now, if we use that thinking, then the procedure of bloodletting makes perfect sense because it doesn't matter how much blood you drain off of somebody because your body will just recreate blood to replace it. Just to be very clear, this is not correct. And it isn't until Harvey does his work that he proves that you only get one supply of blood and your heart acts like a pump to send that around your body. So thanks to William Harvey's discovery, we now realise that bloodletting is a bad idea. But if we think about it, it takes a while for it to catch on because remember people have been taught bloodletting as a treatment for thousands of years so if William Harvey suddenly comes along and says oh I wouldn't do that if I was you because you've only got one supply of blood they're gonna say what do you know we've been bloodletting for centuries yeah it takes a long time for new ideas like this especially a radical one that challenges Galen's teachings to actually catch on now Harvey is very much inspired by the creation of the water pump. Nice little link to science and technology there uh, to inspire this idea of the heart acting like the blood, uh, sorry, pumping, uh, sorry, heart acting like a pump, pumping blood around the body. He also performs dissections, but he doesn't do them on human beings. He does it on cold blooded animals like lizards and reptiles. And the reason he uses cold blooded animals, as you may well know from your science studies, is because their hearts beat a lot slower than humans and warm blooded animals do. So he was able to really observe how the heart works and how it pumps the blood around the body. So this, I think, is a huge, huge, huge breakthrough. In medicine and I think sometimes it gets a little bit underplayed because thanks to Harvey's theory number one like I said bloodletting doesn't make sense and we've now got the evidence even though it's going to take a little bit of time for people to catch on to that and when I say a little bit of time I'm talking centuries but also 
thanks to um, Harvey's theory about this idea of the blood pumping, sorry, the heart pumping blood around the body. Don't know why I can't say that sentence at the moment, but but thanks to him knowing that medicine makes sense. Vaccination makes sense. Imagine if Galen's theory was true, that our body constantly burns up and recreates blood. You'd have to be vaccinating yourself constantly. But now we've got Harvey's ideas. We know that a vaccine, when it is injected into our bodies, travels all around our body and stays within our system with that in mind. So lots and lots of significant developments that are able to use William Harvey's work. And because of that, I think it's quite a big deal. The way that I remember and advise students to remember what Harvey did was I think of it as Harvey Hart. Harvey Hart. That's how I remember, because especially Vesalius, Parry and Harvey, the three of them are often taught together as a kind of trio. So it's good to have a way to distinguish from between them. So the way I remember it is Harvey Hart. Hope that helps you as well. John Hunter. Here is a real fascinating guy. Um, I've just noticed that I'm <laughs> completely unintentionally. I'm kind of sat in a very similar pose to uh, to John Hunter is doing in that picture there <laughs> um, right now. Um, John Hunter was uh, English. I, actually, he was from Scotland, but we kind of classify him as being British for our study. And he had a huge, wide medical experience and expertise. He starts off training in the anatomy uh, with his brother in his anatomy school. And he also does a lot of work in surgery and uh, becomes quite a high up war surgeon as well. And so he's able to use lots and lots of different kind of interactivity. And he's a big advocate of this idea that anatomy and surgery go hand in hand, that a surgeon can't be at the top of his game. And I do mean his, I'm afraid at this time, he wouldn't have got a female surgeon. A surgeon can only be at the top of his game if he truly understands the anatomy of the human body. Think back to what we were just saying before about pare and false limbs. So he was quite the pioneer because he had a few radical techniques. Uh, one of the ones that always sticks in my mind and in the mind of the students that I teach is about how John Hunter wanted to experiment with this idea if you could have two venereal diseases at the same time. And to do that, he gives himself gonorrhea and syphilis actually gives it to him himself and he gets incredibly sick and has to undergo a mercury vapor treatment which was the way that you cured venereal diseases and STIs back then which is hideous within itself but used it to basically write up his findings it's like he wanted to experience what the illnesses were like to be able to fully understand them which was really really radical at this time and I don't mean to sound like I'm talking down on him because I'm not, but it sounds kind of mad, kind of mad, I would say. Um, so, yeah, he was very radical with his techniques and uh, he kind of encouraged similar techniques to the people that he taught uh, as well. Uh, like I said, he was big in the field of surgery as well, and he actually becomes part of the Company of Surgeons, uh, which was set up by the British government to showcase the skills of actual qualified trained surgeons as opposed to barber surgeons. Something we talked about in the medieval period with John of Arden, who wanted to have this way of distinguishing between the two. We have the Company of Surgeons, which later becomes the Royal College of Surgeons, and John Hunter was part of that in the very, very early stages. He writes loads and loads of books, loads and loads of books. Uh, he uh, publishes some on the idea about gunshot wounds, a nice link back to Paré here between Hunter and Paré. Um, Hunter believes that a gunshot wound should be treated the same as any other kind of wound on the body, whereas previously a lot of surgeons were treating them completely differently. Um, he obviously writes up about his venereal disease experiment and uh, he talks a lot about uh, cancers and infections as well. My personal favourite book that he does, though, was about the history of teeth, which I'm sure is a really riveting read. So lots of books, lots of widespread communication from Hunter's ideas. And 
despite the fact that Hunter really rises to the top of his game, by the time he dies, he is right back down the bottom again and he dies in absolute poverty. And his house was full of specimen jars full of animals, plants, fossils, diseased organs and other body parts as well. If you take a look at the picture, you can kind of see a couple of them there as well. Uh, I believe over 3000 he had in his house. So uh, it would have been a bit weird if he went around for the first time and saw all these jars full of different body parts and so on and so forth. But you can't really knock Hunter for being a bit a bit out there and a bit mad. And let's face it, history happens thanks to pioneers, thanks to game changers who are willing to challenge the rules and willing to make those boundaries to be pushed and to really step outside the box. So good on you, John Hunter. Even if your techniques were a little bit mad, you really helped medicine to develop. Let's move on to the biggest time period for individuals. As in, this is where you would have learned about the most number of individuals. We are moving into the industrial era. Let's kick things off with Edward Jenner. Now, some of you out there may well have looked at Jenner as part of your Renaissance study. Uh, personally, I like to use him as the beginning of the industrial era because he's a good link between the past in the Renaissance and the individuals we've learned about and the future as well with some of the other individuals we will learn about in the industrial era and beyond. So Edward Jenner is the person who comes up with the concept of vaccination and the idea of trying to prevent disease isn't a new one. Uh, the idea is about inoculation and being around for some time. Now, just to be clear about the difference, inoculation is when you are given a weakened form of the same disease to help protect your body against it. And vaccination is when you are given a similar disease. So, for example, uh, the flu jab is an example of inoculation because you're given a weakened version of the flu. Whereas the HPV jab that um, girls have is a form of vaccination because you are given cervical cancer itself. You are given uh, something that is similar to that, that your body can start to develop those antibodies to. So not a brand new idea, but um, definitely one that was a lot more effective, as we shall discuss. So previously to Jenna's work, the only way to be protected against smallpox, the big killer disease of the industrial era and before, actually, uh, was for inoculation. But it was really expensive. It would cost you around £20 to get in, uh, inoculated, which is a lot of money back then, a substantial amount of money. So something that was only available to the rich. And it was also a very risky procedure as well. Nowadays, we have very exact measurements of how much you are given in a vaccine or in, in inoculation, whereas previously it was all kind of trial and error. So if you were given uh, too much of the smallpox pus in your inoculation, which is what would happen. They would wipe the pus into an incision in your arm or somewhere on your body. Then you would just end up getting smallpox anyway. And then if they didn't give you enough smallpox pus rubbed into your little incision for your inoculation, then you wouldn't be protected against it and you'd catch it anyway. So it was a risky procedure, lots and lots of trial and error until we get Edward Jenner. So Jenna was an apprentice surgeon from the age of 13 and he was a student of John Hunter's and he keeps in touch with John Hunter when he eventually moves away uh, from the big city of London out to the countryside to Gloucestershire at the age of 23. And when he moves out to Gloucester, he starts working as a country doctor. Now, what he noticed was that milkmaids the women who would milk cows would quite often get cowpox, but never seemed to get smallpox. And he was wondering, is it possible that having contracted cowpox previously makes you immune to getting smallpox? So he decided to test his theory out initially on a young boy called James Phipps in uh, 1796. Uh, this young boy was eight years old and he gave James Phipps cowpox. And then a couple of weeks later, 
he gave uh, uh, him smallpox. Now, when I say he gave it to him, I'm not talking like a full on, here's a huge amount of the disease, you're going to get really sick. We're talking like the amount that you would get inoculated with, for instance. And he was able to prove that his theory was correct. James Phipps did not contract smallpox. Now, the reason he needed to experiment with a young child is because the immune system at that age is pretty much like a blank slate. So it wouldn't have worked more so on an adult. It had to be a young child. But he did repeat his test on 16 different people. And the findings demonstrated that, yes, being vaccinated with smallpox, sorry, cowpox, excuse me, will protect you from smallpox. And on the back of his findings, he decided to call this process vaccination from the Latin word vacca, meaning cow. So big, big, big developments. His experiments were done in 1796. He then publishes his findings in 1798. And there was lots of opposition to his idea. Now, one of the big reasons was because Jenna could say, hey, if you have cowpox previously, you won't get smallpox. He can, tell, he can tell you that it works. But if someone was to ask him, well, how does that work? Why don't I get smallpox? He wouldn't be able to tell them. So that kind of discredited his work and meant that a lot of people didn't trust him. There was also lots of snobbery towards Jenna from the city doctors thinking, oh, well, what would you know? You're just a country doctor. What would you know? Lots of snobbery going on there. Also, big religious attitudes at this time to do with this idea that vaccination was like playing God. We are still dealing with a time, despite all of the medical developments and scientific progress of the Renaissance, people still are holding on to this idea that God sends illness as a punishment. And if you are vaccinating, you're trying to stop yourself from getting illness, then it's like you are doing God's work. So there was lots and lots of problems with that in mind. Nonetheless, the government saw a lot of potential. And in 1802, they granted him £10,000. Now, 20, 20 quid was a lot back then. You can just imagine how much £10,000 would have been. You want to chuck a couple more zeros on the end of that for us to understand it today. And not only that, in 1853, having seen how well it works, they make it compulsory to receive a vaccination against smallpox. They tried it on a voluntary basis previous to that, but in 1853, they make it compulsory. You have to have it. And what happens? The number of people getting and dying from smallpox goes down massively. Lots of very influential people get vaccinated against smallpox using Jenner's technique, uh, members of the royal family. We have Napoleon using his technique and also over in America as well. We have techniques being uh, used like that over there, too. Lots and lots of significance for Jenner. A great long term significance will obviously be when other vaccines are developed as well. But also in the 1980s, smallpox as an illness is eradicated from the world. You cannot get smallpox anymore thanks to the many years of vaccination using Edward Jenner's technique. Now, for the individual that most people regard to be the most significant person from our medicine study, Louis Pasteur is the individual who, after centuries and centuries of people not really fully understanding why disease happens, he is the man who is going to discover germs. So before Pasteur's work, we have various different theories about why disease happens. We've got Illness is sent as a punishment from God uh, for humans being imbalanced, um, planets being aligned and other superstitious ideas, miasma, bad air causing disease as well. But a new one that was developing during the industrial era was this idea of spontaneous generation. And Louis Pasteur, through an experiment that he did or series of experiments, I should say, was able to prove that this was incorrect. And in the next slide, I'm going to hopefully try and show you what spontaneous generation was and how that was different to germ theory. OK, so I'm just going to grab my pen here. Uh, let's go with that one. OK, so 
The idea that existed before Pasteur's germ theory was the concept of spontaneous generation. Now, I just need you to imagine for a second that this apple down here, oh no, down over here, sorry. Oh, that's not good. We'll, we'll give it a go, hang on a second. Sorry, as you can tell, this is the first time I'm using this. Let's imagine that this apple here, here we go, has gone bad, here we go. There it is, ooh, yuck. Like kind of gone brown and things like that. And then suddenly coming off of it are all of these like flies and things like that. There they go. Now, spontaneous generation was the belief that these like kind of, sorry, these like flies and things like that and like little maggots you'd see growing inside of the apple were actually germs and these germs spontaneously so kind of like out of nowhere sorry for this horrible oh my goodness this horrible uh going over there um this spontaneously kind of out of nowhere these germs spontaneously generated they spontaneously appeared when food went bad and the presence of these things essentially were germs okay that's what they used to believe now pasteur's germ theory is the opposite his germ theory was, let's add a bit of colouring to this here. Here we go. Let's imagine that's all gone yucky and bad. There we go. And we've got our flies kind of going off it as well. I'm glad you're using your imagination here. Those of you who are taught by me will know I am no artist, but it's okay. I've got lots of other strengths. So, yeah. So here we go. Let's draw some little wiggly maggots on there as well. Now, spontaneous generation. Remember, these flies and maggots, they are the germs that are created by something going bad. Pasteur is able to prove the opposite, that this has gone bad because of germs. So germs aren't created because something goes bad. Something goes bad because the germs are there in the first place. And don't be fools. Maggots and flies aren't germs. They're maggots and flies. OK, he didn't say that, but you get my point. So that is the theory. The previous one, spontaneous generation, which is wrong. OK is wrong he disproves that through some experiments that this one here his germ theory is correct oh, i'm kind of getting used to the pen now not too bad so that's one of the things that he does and he does that through a variety of experiments using air and collecting his ideas um, based on seeing the germs that are present and collected in certain sterile flasks pasteur publishes his discovery and his findings from all of his experiments in 1861. Now, if you commit one date from this study to your memory, let it be that one, 1861. It is a significant turning point in medical history. So 1861, before then, we classify that as a time when we were unaware of germ theory and after it is when we are aware. Now, don't get me wrong, much like with everybody in our study, when someone puts a new idea forward, people don't just suddenly accept it overnight. It takes a while for that to pick up and for that to be carried forward. So we are, however, compared to previous individuals who come up with new ideas, we are going to see that Pasteur's work is picked up a lot quicker than some of the ideas that we've seen previously though, because it works. And as well as that, we're gonna see lots of other people who have similar ideas and also are able to extend on Pasteur's work. Now, one last thing to mention about Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a scientist and not a doctor. And this is important because he couldn't apply his germ theory to humans and human disease okay he couldn't relate it to that he was able to relate it to food and liquids for instance he worked in the milk industry and in the alcohol industry and also did some work in the silk trade as well but he wasn't able to apply this thinking to actual human disease it would take a doctor to do that and here is that doctor his name is Robert Koch, to pronounce it correctly. However, again, if you've been taught by me, you'll know this anyway. I, I, I really struggle with that. So I'm going to be referring to him as Robert Koch. I hope you don't mind. Robert Koch is the man who is going to take Louis Pasteur's scientific work on germs and he is going to apply it 
to humans. And he can do that again, as I said, because he is a doctor. Now, this next slide is going to show how Robert Koch develops on Pasteur's idea. OK, I need you to imagine that there are two shelves, one dedicated to Louis Pasteur and one to Robert Koch. Let's talk it through. So here is the shelf belonging to Louis Pasteur. And on Pasteur's shelf, there is a big jar full of germs. OK, and you can see the jar just there, okay, all the different coloured dots and so on and so forth. So Pasteur is able to say, here they are, these are germs. OK, so that's the shelf for Louis Pasteur. That's his discovery. That is germ theory. Now, let me show you what Robert Koch, let me show you what his shelf would look like. OK, give you a second or two to have a look. Can you see the difference? The difference is that Robert Koch not only was able to identify germs in general, he was able to identify which specific germs caused which specific diseases. So, for example, we have got tuberculosis, cholera and plague. Just three of the illnesses he was able, three of the germs, excuse me, he was able to identify and pair up with their illness. Okay, so that's the key difference. Pasteur can talk about germs in general. Koch is able to identify which germs, excuse me, which germs cause which diseases. We're going to talk about why that's important next. So Robert Koch, he was a German doctor and he was incredibly methodical in his practice. He was able to do this extraction of germs like we've just been seeing with the jars on the shelf there through doing copious experiments with mice. And one of the big things he was a massive fan of was repeating experiments, not just repeating it, say, 16 or 17 times like Louis Pasteur did. He was a fan of repeating things hundreds of times. And he believed that it was only then you could be truly 100 percent confident that you had the results that you had in front of you. There were no possible anomalies or anything like that. So he worked with mice. He also developed a solid medium to examine bacteria in. Um, I often liken it to an agar plate, if you've ever used one of those in science, for instance. So he was able to develop that as it was a lot better than try and look at it through liquids. Now, Pasteur and Koch were rivals. Okay, they were they were working around the same time. Koch was a tiny bit younger than Pasteur. And so he Pasteur essentially comes up with his ideas first. If you want to go chicken and the egg and all that jazz. Um, but what happens is, is that in the early 1870s, France and Germany go to war with each other. The Franco-Prussian War. Uh, if any of you have learned about the Treaty of Versailles as well, you'll know about that war to an extent. It's a very, very long term beef, essentially, that's going on between France and Germany. And what that has to do with uh, Koch and Pasteur is that both of their governments gave them money to make sure they could be ahead of the game when it came to research into germs. So Pasteur was getting money from the French government and Koch was getting money from the German government. And one of the ways that they were rivaling each other further to their own discoveries was through creating vaccines. Going back to Koch's discovery in essence, but when you can identify which germs cause which diseases, that means not only can you create vaccines to prevent against that illness, then you can also create cures to get rid of it as well. Think about what we're going through at the moment with coronavirus, with COVID-19. That process of actually isolating a germ and saying, here it is, is a really, really long one. But once you've got it, you can start creating vaccines to protect people against it. And you can start creating treatments to help people who have the condition as well. Now, obviously, we're dealing with it as a virus at the moment, so it's possible that it wouldn't be uh, we wouldn't be able to find a cure per se, but definitely things that would make the symptoms a lot, lot easier. Bit of a tangent, but it shows the relevance of the work that Robert Koch was doing. So Pasteur and Koch often seen side by side. Personally, I feel Koch is a little bit more significant just because of the possibilities. But then again, you can go chicken and the egg and Pasteur is also important and Koch would not have been able to do his work had it not been for Pasteur.
from looking at individuals who focused on the reason why disease happened, we're now going to move into surgery. We're going to start off looking at Joseph Lister. But just before I do, just want to recap that with surgery, there are three main problems to be solved in surgery. The first is to do with infection. The second is pain. And the third is blood loss. Now, two out of those three problems are going to be solved by individuals during the industrial era, starting with Joseph Lister, who is going to deal with the problem of infection. So Joseph Lister was a massive fan of Louis Pasteur's work and Louis Pasteur's germ theory. And he thought that essentially infection must happen when germs, which are in the air, enter into a wound. So how could he possibly create a barrier to stop that from happening? Now, as a surgeon, he was more thinking about this happening during surgical procedures, as opposed to, say, if you fell over and grazed your knee or something like that. And what he experimented with, with this idea of a chemical barrier, was a substance known as carbolic acid. And the idea would be that surgeons would need to soak their hands and their medical instruments, their surgical instruments, excuse me, in the carbolic acid to make sure they were disinfected, essentially. Uh, he also suggested that this carbolic spray should be kind of put across the patient whilst the surgery is being performed. Now, his theory made perfect sense and obviously makes sense to us today because antiseptics are a huge part of our life, especially in this kind of COVID-19 climate where it's all about sanitising and using hand gel and so on and so forth. And what Joseph Lister did was he made sure before he published his findings that he had evidence that this actually worked. So before he published his work in 1867, he did 11 different attempts on using this carbolic acid with patients to try and see if they could prevent wounds getting infected. Uh, an example would be, uh, sorry, the most famous example is uh, a young boy called Jamie Greenlease who had his, um, who was run over, excuse me, by a horse, horse and cart and his leg was really badly damaged. Now, once upon a time, he would need to have had that amputated. But Lister wanted to use it as a chance to do a bit of experimentation. So what he did was he soaked some bandages in carbolic acid and wrapped jo uh, Jamie Greenlease's leg in those bandages. And I think it took about six weeks or something like that. And his leg wounds had completely healed. And so he'd not only created that chemical barrier, but also with the bandages, that physical barrier as well. So he was able to prove that carbolic acid does work in preventing infection. Now, the problem was, though, because as we've seen with a lot of people and the individuals we've studied, a lot of new ideas are met with opposition and surgeons in particular were not the biggest fans of what he was doing because it was a really horrible kind of material to work with. I mean, if you look, look at the name, it's a carbolic acid and it meant that the surgeon's hands and everything got really cracked and so on and so forth. Uh, and also it made the uh, surgery a very wet condition uh, in which the surgery was being performed in. Also, Lister often changed his technique and changed his mind about some of his findings. And that meant that the people didn't see him as a particularly trustworthy source. On top of that, he was a really shy individual. So when people did criticise him, he very rarely would uh, stand up for himself. But nonetheless, his antiseptics absolutely worked. And by the 1890s, the attitudes against the ideas that Joseph Lister came up with had completely changed and were even moving towards aseptic surgery, the idea of removing germs from surgery altogether, all thanks to the work that Joseph Lister did. The next problem in surgery that was solved was the problem of pain. Now, pain was a massive issue in surgery because it meant that surgery had to be performed incredibly quickly because you'd have people wriggling around and all sorts of things. And it also led to a lot of mistakes. Now, technically speaking, you can't die from being in pain, but you can die from things like infection happening and so on and so forth. Now, just to kind of put a bit of chronology in here, 
although I've spoken about Lister first, the person we're going to look at now, James Simpson, who did work on anaesthetics and solving that problem of pain, he was doing his work before Joseph Lister, before germ theory was part of the know-how of doctors. So let's talk a little bit about his discovery. So he doesn't discover anaesthetics completely. Anaesthetics have been used since um, the medieval times, and even going back into the ancient times as well. You may well have learnt about uh, hemlock, opium, mandrake root. They were all used as herbal anaesthetics. So it's not a new idea. But the problem was is that previous anaesthetics were not especially effective, and there was a lot of trial and error with that as well. What we're moving on to in the industrial era is people coming up with chemical anaesthetics as well. Just to mention really briefly, there were two other chemical anaesthetics that came along before James Simpson's chloroform. We had the nitrous oxide, which is essentially laughing gas, which wasn't a particularly uh, strong anaesthetic. And also we had something known as ether. And ether, although effective as an anaesthetic in knocking people out, was also incredibly flammable and made people vomit quite substantially. So not ideal when you're trying to perform surgery um, and trying to stop the problems of pain with having someone vomiting whilst they're asleep. Not great. So then we get on to the discovery made by James Simpson. So Simpson makes this discovery in 1847, but it was completely by accident. So we've got another great example of the factor of chance in medicine in the course. The idea uh, that links it to chance is that James Simpson was experimenting with different chemicals to try and find an effective anaesthetic when by accident he knocked a jar of chloroform onto the floor, the fumes evaporated and James Simpson got knocked out completely and was away with the fairies. He, when he came round, he realised that there were very few to no side effects whatsoever from the chloroform. So by complete chance, he discovered a super effective anaesthetic and one that was used for quite some time. Now, there was, again, some opposition because... There always is, as we keep saying, uh, predominantly we've got a religious opposition to anaesthetics because pain was sent as punishment from God, especially to women during childbirth. Very much thanks to Eve and the Garden of Eden there. Uh, also, we have some ex uh, examples of people dying because of anaesthetics. Uh, for instance, we've got Hannah Greener who died during a very simple toe related operation because of the anaesthetic. But despite all of the scare stories like Hannah Greener's, James Simpson's got a massive boost in confidence when Queen Victoria herself used chloroform during childbirth and gave it her seal of approval. Now, with anaesthetics, meaning that patients were no longer in pain and could be put to sleep, essentially, for um, internal operations to be done, we now see a lot more complicated operations taking place and a lot longer operations taking place. But remember, this is happening before Joseph's, uh, Joseph Lister, excuse me, Joseph Lister's discovery of antiseptics. So, yes, it's great. We've got pain free surgery and we've got longer surgery, but we've also now got the opportunity for infection to go deeper into the body because of the complicated operations that were being carried out. But nonetheless, once the uh, antiseptics and anaesthetics are able to be used side by side, we have got much, much safer surgery. Uh, issues relating to blood loss in surgery will not be solved until the First World War. There were significant changes made to public health during the industrial era. And one of the people we can attribute to that is this guy here, Edwin Chadwick. Now, in 1842, Chadwick, who was a member of Parliament, conducted a report into the living conditions of the poor and noticed that their health needed to be improved. Now, at this time in the early 1800s, the poor were heavily criticised for being lazy and work shy. And that was the reason that they were poor. Now, Chadwick recommended that that was not the case and that actually the government had some responsibility for the health of its people. Now, before we get too excited, we're not talking a National Health Service here. That's still another good hundred years away. But nonetheless, we are seeing early steps towards it. 
So Chadwick thought of, uh, in his report, about an idea of something known as a board of health. And they would be set up in local authorities where people would wash the streets and supply fresh, clean running water to its citizens. Uh, they would also have medical officers appointed to make sure that this was all being carried out. Now, at the time in the 1840s, the government really had that laissez-faire, don't really care attitude. Like I said before, the poor, if you're unhealthy and you are living in squalor, it's your own fault because you're lazy and you haven't got a decent job. That was the attitude of the government at that time. So to be told you've really got to step up and help them out did not go down particularly well whatsoever. But his report did influence the introduction of the Public Health Act in 1848. It was a completely voluntary public health act where local authorities could, if they wanted to, introduce those boards of health and appoint medical officers. But they did not have to. It wouldn't be until 1875 when the government changed its attitude and that laissez faire attitude started to drift away that it would become compulsory for local authorities to make changes. But Edwin Chadwick is definitely the first person we can attribute to the desire to make changes for the benefits of the life of the poor. Another individual who had an impact on public health was Jon Snow. Nothing to do with Game of Thrones. Now, Jon Snow, our Jon Snow here, is the man who discovers that dirty water causes cholera. Now, in 1848, there were 14,000 deaths from cholera in that one year. Now, cholera is a highly contagious disease, which is spread by, as I've just said, dirty water. And the overcrowded and cramped living conditions of the industrial era cities and towns meant that cholera was incredibly common. No proper sewage systems or anything like that at this stage. Now, John Snow was working at a time, if we look at that date there, 1854, we're talking before germ theory. We are talking about a time when miasma theory especially was very closely linked to cholera. Remember bad air, bad smell. If you think about contaminated water, that is going to smell pretty rough. So, of course, people would naturally want to make that connection. So John Snow wanted to, to conduct an experiment in the Broad Street area of London to be able to prove that it was indeed dirty water that caused cholera. And what he did was he removed the pump handle from the water pump in Broad Street. So nobody could get any water from that pump. Now, the reason he chose that particular area was because there was a really high concentration of cholera deaths in that area. And what he noticed was after removing the pump handle that a lot fewer people were dying from cholera in the Broad Street area. Furthermore, he was able to make a couple of other connections as well. For instance, the people in the nearby brewery on just off Broad Street, all the people who worked there drank the beer instead of the water. So very few of those people ever caught cholera because through the process of making beer, through making alcohol, the liquid would be boiled and therefore the germs burnt away. This is something that we can link forward to Louis Pasteur's germ theory, because a, lot, a big part of that is the concept of applying heat to get rid of germs. So that was one thing that also kind of tweaked in his mind about why it was dirty water. Uh, another one was about a woman who died uh, a couple of streets away from the Broad Street area. And that was because she got her servants to bring her water from the Broad Street pump previously uh, because she liked the taste and the smell, which is really, really awful. But nonetheless, another way that he could make the connection. Uh, but the thing that really kind of made him confident that that is exactly what was going on, that that was that dirty, contaminated water that was causing cholera, was that he noticed that there was a leaking sewer right next to the water pump. So the sewer was leaking into that water supply. So, of course, we've got that connection there. Now, when I say sewer, by the way, in 1854, nothing to get excited about. We are literally talking hole in the ground stuff. We're not talking decent flowing sewage systems or anything like that. But like I said, nonetheless, he is able to make that link to the true cause of cholera. 
But the issue was, because we're talking pre-germ theory, it's a little bit like Edward Jenner. Jon Snow could say, yeah, it works, but he couldn't exactly explain how. So, again, going to have some opposition to that there. Then about 30 years later, Robert Koch gives a massive boost to Jon Snow's findings because he is able to actually isolate and identify the germ that causes cholera. And again, when you can identify the germ, you can create vaccines and you can create treatments as well. So another big influencer on public health is Jon Snow and his work on finding the true cause of cholera. Now, I've added Florence Nightingale into this presentation, although for those of you who are studying under the AQA Britain, the Health and the People, technically she is not actually on the specification, but she was previously a massive part of the medicine course. So I thought I wanted to just put a few minutes of, uh, of our time here, just learning a little bit about her. I'm sure lots of you looked at Florence Nightingale and the la as the lady with the lamp during primary school. But I'm just going to relate her a little bit to the course that we're studying as well. So Florence Nightingale has a massive history in nursing and hospitals. I'm sure you've noticed on the news with the uh, coronavirus over here that all the temporary big hospitals that are being set up in the big cities are known as Nightingale Hospitals, named after Florence Nightingale herself. Now, Florence Nightingale did her most influential work during the Crimean War in the mid 1850s, and she was actually asked by the Secretary of War to handpick a group of nurses to take over to the Crimea to help solve the issues in their battlefield hospitals. Now, everything she did, which I will roughly outline in a second, uh, had a massive, massive impact. Before she arrived, 42% of soldiers in those battlefield hospitals were dying. Two years later, only 2% of them were dying. So massive, massive impact. Some of the ideas that she brought along was the idea of making the hospital wards, the battlefield hospital wards, much more airy. The idea of having windows, letting light and air in was very, very important. Cleanliness was also very important. And remember, we're talking mid 1850s here. So she's ahead of her time before germ theory, which she also looked at the idea of being able to introduce um, uh, proper meals and food for the people in the hospital as well. By the time she returned to Britain, she was incredibly famous. She had been written about in newspapers and all sorts. And she wrote a really influential book known as Notes on Nursing, which noted down all of her methods and ideas. The people of Britain raised £44,000, that's money in their time as opposed to ours, uh, to be able to help her train nurses. And with that, she set up the Nightingale School of Nursing. Now, nurses, pre pre uh, previous, excuse me, to Nightingale's work, had a really bad reputation. They were slobby and slovenly. They were quite often drunk and not really the kind of reputation that we recognise with nurses nowadays. Uh, Nightingale changes that completely. She has a lot of discipline with her nurses and to the point where she is very insistent that to be a nurse, you have to have some kind of training. So she gets lots and lots of publicity. The reputation of nursing goes up massively and she even meets Queen Victoria. Uh, as a little side note, because I've got to be honest with you, Nightingale's a little bit of a hero of mine. She's a real challenge to the role of women during the industrial era when that expectation of women being housewives and mothers was around. Florence Nightingale was just incredible in terms of all of her knowledge about nursing and hospitals, but also she was an absolutely incredible mathematician and came up with her own type of mathematical diagram known, the, known as the Rose Diagram. Really, really influential in that respect as well. So, like I said, for those of you studying under AQA, technically Nightingale isn't on the specification. You won't find her in any AQA related revision guides or textbooks, but she is still an incredibly significant part of industrial era medicine. And now we move in to our final time period, the modern era. 
again, feel free to pause and just take in the amazingness that is this picture here. I wonder how many different things you can identify from the 20th century, not just from your medicine study, but also from your America studies as well. For those of you who have done that, you'll probably see my own little uh, personal historical hero within there, too. But here we go. Modern medicine. This is when we're going to see lots of rapid progress. Not quite as many named individuals as during the industrial era, but nonetheless, lots of very significant ones. We're going to start off with these two individuals here, Booth and Roundtree, who are doing their work right at the very end of the 1800s and at the very beginning of the 1900s. Both Booth and Roundtree did reports which looked into the living conditions and the life of the poor. Now, Booth did his studies in London, whereas Roundtree did his studies up in York. Now, they essentially start to set up this concept of people living below the poverty line. So that idea of there's a certain amount of money that somebody needs to bring in each week in order to be able to have food and shelter for them and their families. And they did work around this idea that a significant proportion of our population was living well below that poverty line. And the work of Booth and Roundtree went on to influence the liberal reforms that were put together in the early 1900s by the Liberal government, hence why they're known as the Liberal Reforms. So these two people can be used as kind of furthering on to Edwin Chadwick's work from back in the 1840s, but Booth and Roundtree are definitely doing their work around the turn of the 20th century, hence why we're using them during the modern era. Just a few individuals now to do with developments that were made during the First World War. X-rays were a huge development during the First World War and they were incredibly crucial as well because of the amount of shrapnel wounds that were being, uh, sorry, that were affecting a lot of the soldiers. If we think about the way in which trench warfare happened during World War One, this idea of shells being used, long ranged artillery guns and everything like that. Shrapnel wounds were, like I said, were incredibly common and being able to identify where certain bullets were and so on and so forth was vital to be able to make sure that soldiers Soldiers could have the metal removed, hopefully, although a lot of them did um, continue their lives with the shrapnel with bullets still within them. But nonetheless, hopefully the intention was to remove the metal for them to be able to go back out then onto the front lines once they had recovered. Technically speaking, uh, x-rays were discovered before the First World War by Wilhelm Röntgen. Uh, back in 1895, he was a German scientist who discovered X-rays, but they really come into their own during the First World War. An individual who did do his work during the First World War is Howard Gillies, and he did work to do with plastic surgery. Now, we're not talking about boob jobs and, you know, bum lifts and things like that. We're talking uh, work to do with skin grafts. A lot of burning injuries uh, happened during trench warfare, and uh, not only from fire itself, but also chemical burns from gas and so on. So Howard, Harold Gillies, excuse me, was a big pioneer for plastic surgery like skin grafts during the First World War. And then we have blood transfusions. You'll remember from before with surgery, those three main problems, pain, infection and blood loss. Pain and infection are solved during the industrial era, but the problem to do with blood loss is solved thanks to the work on blood transfusions during World War I. Now, technically speaking, blood transfusions had been attempted for quite some time before the First World War, massively unsuccessfully. Uh, there's even evidence back in the Renaissance of somebody trying to use blood from a dog to transfuse into a human being. But the reason why we are more successful in the First World War is thanks to the two individuals that are li uh, listed there. Karl Landsteiner did work to do with particular blood groups, that not all blood was exactly the same, and you needed to have a compatible blood group to receive the blood and have a successful transfusion. The other one was Albert Hustin, who did work on making sure that blood didn't clot before it was actually transfused into a human, because as soon as blood clots, it is useless for that transfusion purpose. So his work on what we call anticoagulants was really, really useful for those developments during the First World War.
we're moving now from World War I into looking at individuals during World War II. And we're going to be looking at Sir William Beveridge, who you can see on the mug that's being held up by that cheeky soldier just there on that tankard. The caption for this cartoon is a rare and refreshing beverage. And it was put on the front page of the Daily Mirror newspaper in 1942 to celebrate what Beveridge had written about in his Beveridge report. Now, much like Edwin Chadwick's report in 1842, got to say, from the point of view of remembering dates, absolutely love the fact that those two reports are exactly 100 years apart from each other. Chadwick, 1842, Beveridge 1942. Love that for a little bit of a memory link there. So Beveridge's report, which was put forward by the government, they asked him to do this report, which looked into the living conditions in our country. Again, even all of this time after Edwin Chadwick doing his report 100 years ago, we are still in 1942 investigating into the lives of the poor because Poverty is still a massive problem in our country, and especially with so many men from working class backgrounds going to fight in the war. Just as a side note, conscription, forcing people to fight in the war, was compulsory straight away in World War Two. In World War One, they hung on for about two years until they forced people to fight. But in World War Two, it was compulsory to fight in the war straight away. So a huge number of working class men were brought in with that in mind. Now, back to Beveridge and his report. Beveridge's report identified that there were five giants that were ruining the lives of the poor, not literally metaphorical giants. And they were want, ignorance, of the people who were in charge, disease, squalor, dirt, and idleness, laziness. Again, not on behalf of the people who are poor, but on behalf of those people who could do something about it. Beveridge suggested that the government needed to set up a health system which looked after people, in his words, from cradle to grave from the moment you're born to the moment you die. And his idea would take what was already set up by the Liberals, this idea of a national insurance system. Again, you would have learned about that. And instead, he suggested the idea of a national health service. So Beveridge suggests this in 1942. And for the working class members of our society, that was an incredibly popular idea. Thinking again about this source, it's from the Daily Mirror, a tabloid newspaper that was widely read by the working classes, which makes sense that this front page cartoon shows them really celebrating Beveridge's work. Now, the richer members of society, however, were not so keen because where is the money for this National Health Service going to come from? is going to come from taxes and it means that taxes are going to need to go up. Obviously, the rich being naive a little bit here are not realising that working class people would be paying the taxes too. But William Beveridge, 1942, in that report, he is able to come up with the idea of a national health service. But it is this guy who is uh, dressed up as a, a matron, if you will, and Nurin Bevin, AB, can you see it there on his little hat that he's wearing? He is the one who will actually create the National Health Service. Bevin was a Labour politician. The Labour Party was set up in the early 1900s to represent the rights of the workers. So it makes sense that it would be a Labour politician who was able to set up the National Health Service. Now, there were, at this time after World War II, 3,000 hospitals in this country already, but they were all private hospitals. You had to pay to use them. And under the National Health Service, they would all become part of the government. They would be what we call nationalised. And that would therefore mean that they would be funded by the government through taxes, and therefore people would be able to access them for free. Now, doctors absolutely hated the idea of a free national health service. 
and you can see they're discussed in this picture here. You can see the briefcase, hopefully, of the man who's just stood at the front there, and you can see a couple of the other briefcases as well. We've got MD, medical doctor, going on there. Now, they all hate the idea of a national health service because it means less money for them. For centuries, doctors have made a lot of money by charging their patients to have access to health care. But the National Health Service was to put an end to all of that. Now, Bevan received loads of opposition. In January 1946, 90% of doctors said they would not be part of the National Health Service. But they underestimated just how strongly Bevan felt about how much our country deserved a National Health Service. So he worked with the doctors and compromised with them and they came up with an agreement and that would be that they would, the doctors, would be paid by the government for their work with NHS patients but as well as that they were still allowed to see patients privately and charge people for their services. So a compromise completely. And it absolutely worked because then in July 1948, when the National Health Service opened its doors for the first time, 90% of doctors now agreed with the National Health Service. So it was a massive, massive boost for Bevan. And obviously we still have the National Health Service to this day with all that's going on with COVID-19 at the moment. I think there's a real renewed popularity and respect for the National Health Service, which I personally am thrilled about. The National Health Service is a great one to discuss in terms of long term significance as well, because of the problems our National Health Service is facing with an ageing population that we have today, meaning that the NHS is really overstretched and needs a lot more government funding to help. But I'm not talking about the NHS now. We're talking about the guy who put it together and you're in Bevin. The final group of people we're going to be having a look at are to do with the development of antibiotics in the 20th century. We're going to start off with looking at these two individuals here who create these early antibiotics known as magic bullets. The first one is developed in 1905 by Paul Ehrlich and that was known as Salvasan 606. Now, Paul Ehrlich was a um, doctor who was part of Robert Koch's team. So Ehrlich had adopted Koch's practice of really methodical experimentation and repeating experiments as well. With that in mind, the reason it is known as Salvasan 606 is because Paul Ehrlich came up with 605 other compounds which did not work until they came across the 606th compound that was successful. So as the phrase goes, if at first you don't succeed, try 605 other times and you'll probably get to where you want to go. Now, Salvasan 606 was developed specifically to treat syphilis. Quite why uh, early antibiotics are used specifically for treating venereal disease, I have no idea. Maybe it's a little bit of a shout out to John Hunter. Who knows? But if you're wondering, well, if Salvasan 606 is such a great antibiotic, why don't we use it? Well, the reason is because although Salvasan 606 successfully killed off the bacteria that caused syphilis, it also killed the patient as well. So not great. Then we get the work of Gerhard Domak about 30 years later in the early 1930s, working on a drug known as Prontazil. Now, this again was a successful antibiotic that was used to kill off septicemia. That's to do with the bacteria which causes blood poisoning. And we've got a little bit of a, a role of chance here to an extent, because one of the reasons Gerhard Domek was able to discover his compound of Prontazil was successful was because his daughter pricked her finger on an infected needle and he was able to treat her with the Prontazil and she was absolutely fine. He, however, possibly should have been sorry, investigated for his parenting skills for leaving infected needles lying around in the first place. But anyway, two early individuals to do with the development of antibiotics. And we come to the main man himself, possibly one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century, possibly ever, you could argue, Alexander Fleming, who discovers the well-known antibiotic 
penicillin, which is still used today. He makes his discovery back in 1928, but his work actually begun way before that, where he was invited during the First World War to go to the battlefield hospitals to investigate the bacteria known as, and I'm really hoping I'm going to say this right, Staphylococci, Staphylococcus. The infection rate in battlefield hospitals was rapidly increasing and the government wanted to work out a way that that could be reduced. So this is when um, Fleming starts doing his ideas. Sadly, his uh, discovery will outdate the First World War, but nonetheless, it is still a significant discovery. And yet again, we've got another great example of chance where, as we can see in that stained glass window there, which is in the church right next to St. Mary's Hospital, where um, Alexander Fleming did all his work in London. You can see that stack of Petri dishes there on the left hand side. Essentially, Fleming was following that kind of methodical process of testing and testing lots of different forms of bacteria and lots of different forms of antibiotic drugs until as the legend has it, he left his laboratory for us a couple of days. Uh, I remember being taught when I did the medicine course that he went on holiday. And during this time, he left the window open and some spores from a lab laboratory, excuse me, above his flew in through the window and into some of the Petri dishes that had been left out on the side on the side, excuse me. And lo and behold, when he returned from his jollies, he noticed, as you can see in the picture just down in the bottom right there, that he had found this mold that was able to repel the bacteria. You can see that kind of almost like little halo going on around that big white clump of the mold there. And again, happens completely by chance. He writes up his findings in 1928, and then he doesn't do anything else. Literally writes about it, goes into a journal, and that's it. Nothing else happens because he didn't see the significance in it, nor did he do any testing on, uh, sorry, on animals whatsoever. So he wasn't really able to do a lot of proving of his discoveries. That would require the work of two and our final two individuals. Our final two, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain. They picked up on Fleming's article 10 years later in 1938, when both Florey and Chain were working together at Oxford University. Now, Howard Florey was English, but Ernst Chain was a German Jew. And earlier on in the 1930s, he escaped Nazi Germany and fled to live in Great Britain to escape the Holocaust. So these two people eventually, like I said, end up working together at Oxford University and seeing the potential in Fleming's work and that it could be furthered. They asked the British government for some money to conduct some research and the British government dug deep into their pockets and gave them 25 pounds. Yep, 25 quid. Could not do much with that now for sure really couldn't do much with it back then. Now, if you're wondering why was our government being so stingy, let's have a look at that date again. 1938. We are looking at one year before the start of World War II. So I think it's fair to say that at this time, the British government's pockets and their money was really being invested elsewhere. But there was a country that wasn't keen on getting involved in World War One. sorry, World War Two that would be able to give them a lot more money. And that was America. So Howard Florey flies over to America and uh, has a meeting with their government to ask for some money. And they are given a substantial amount to be able to conduct some research, thanks to America not getting involved in World War II at first, being able to loan them that money that they needed to have the penicillin being developed. Now, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain did a lot of techniques that we would recognise again from the work of Robert Koch. We had a lot of methodical experimentation on mice and they soon learnt that you needed a much larger quantity of penicillin to treat a man as you would a mouse. 
So they were able to prove that penicillin worked, but now they needed to produce it in huge quantities. Now, forgive me, I don't know how much you guys have learned about penicillin as a drug, say, in science, but penicillin is something that needs to be grown. It's not something that you kind of mix stuff together and voila, you've got penicillin. It's something that needs to be grown. It needs to be cultivated. And for that, you need a lot of space. You need a lot of materials to be able to do that. And technically, you kind of need a bit of time as well. So in the experiments that they were conducting, they were really going for some intensive development of the penicillin to the extent where they were trying to grow it in bedpans and things like that. Their opportunity to test it on a human came in 1941 when a policeman had a, an infection or just off the side of his mouth uh, where he'd uh, cut the side of his mouth with uh, a rose thorn and he the policeman excuse me got blood poisoning and the Howard Florian Ernst chain treated him with penicillin and within a couple of days his infection started to clear up and he was getting much much better but then the penicillin ran out and they couldn't give him any more and the infection came back and despite them trying to develop more even to the point of trying to extract the penicillin from the policeman's urine there wasn't enough and sadly the policeman died but you learn lessons in failure as much as you learn them in success as well and it taught us that when you have penicillin you need to have it for a substantial amount of time even if you notice the symptoms are going away and if any of you have ever been on antibiotics you will know that that they tell you you must take this for usually a whole week even if your symptoms clear up so a sad situation but a lesson learned from that nonetheless at this time in 1941, when uh, Florian Chain were able to say they've conducted successful, to an extent, human experiments, America is entering World War II. Okay, we've got the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 1941 that brings America into the war. So now their need and desire for penicillin has gone up massively. And now the British government have taken note of Florian Chain's work as well, and they are now starting to invest and fund their research and the development of penicillin. In America, huge factories and industries were dedicated to mass producing penicillin, and the American government even gave companies interest-free loans to be able to grow the penicillin in their factories. And it was so successful, this massive push, this massive campaign, that in D-Day in World War II in June 1944, huge amounts were able to be used. 2.3 million doses of penicillin were used and several numbers of lives were saved thanks to the work that they did and thanks to it being effective to deploy in a war situation. Now, penicillin is a great thing to talk about in regards to lots of different factors, but also in regards to long term significance, because I'm sure as many of you have come across antibiotics nowadays, like penicillin, are not being given to people quite as often as they used to be. Because what we're starting to notice is that certain infections are becoming resilient to penicillin. Maybe it is something that you've covered in your science classes. And that is it. Wowee, that was a long one. Well done for those of you who stuck it through. And hey, if you didn't, don't worry about it. If it was me, I would have watched this in chunks personally. But well done for making it. I really, really hope you found this useful. I hope it gave you an opportunity to fill in any gaps that you might have with your learning on medicine. But as I always say in these revision videos, I hope there were lots of opportunities where you found yourself thinking, yeah, do you know what? I know this already. So remember, you've got the knowledge in there. This is revision. I'm not telling you anything new, technically speaking. This is all stuff you would have been taught already. So thank you so much for your time today. Don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram as well at One History Help, where I'll be putting some updates to do with videos, but also uh, popping some links on there too to do with um, uh, other useful revision techniques, maybe a few other websites that I found and so on and so forth that I think would be super useful for you. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button because then you can make sure you get notifications when any new videos are put up. Thank you again so much for your time, everybody. I really hope this was useful and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.